Hey guys, Jen over here. And today I'll be going through this uh, H2 physics question on the test of understanding of of trust. So the key the key uh, contention over here is question is part three of this question where um, we are asked to find the change in water level when the ice is fully melted. But we'll be doing the first two parts in order to warm up to the third part. So the question is set in a case where the steel ball, right? As you know, a steel ball by itself will sink in water, right? But because, because the steel ball is more dense than water, but if the steel ball is encased in ice, right, there's a chance that the average density of the ice and the steel ball, right, is going to be less than the density of water. And that's the question, that's the case in this question where the steel ball and ice is floating on the water. And we're given some information about it and we're asked to calculate some quantities. So the first part, right, asks us to calculate the uptrust or thing on the steel ball and ice. And that is just going to be um, the weight of the steel ball and ice. So why is that so? It's because if we draw the steel ball and ice and we draw a force body diagram, right, then there's two, act, there's two forces acting in the vertical direction. One is the up thrust by, by the water, by, by the displaced water. And another one is the, is the weight of um, ice plus the weight of the water. Sorry, sorry, not water of the steel ball. That's the weight of the steel ball. So ice and the steel ball, the combined weight, right? And because uh because this object is in equilibrium, right? The two net the net force must be zero. So the two forces being in the opposite directions must be equal in magnitude. So um the question asks us for to calculate this quantity, right? So in order to co calculate this quantity, we need to we just need to calculate the weight of the ice plus the weight of the steel. And in this case, because we're given the radius of the steel ball right over here, we know it's one cm, and we're given the mass of the ice, so we can easily calculate the weight of um, both objects. And the weight is just going to be, right? So let's calculate the weight of the ice first. It's just going to be 400 grams times 9.81 times g. And for the weight of steel, it's going to be the volume, right? So this is the volume of steel of the steel ball times the density of steel times 9.81, right? So I believe this should be uh, simple enough. And that will give us 4.25 Newtons to 3SF. And that's the answer for the first part. So um, yeah, so that's a quick comment, right? Uh, what's the source of the up thrust? The source of the up thrust is the displaced water. So what does it mean by displaced water exactly, right? Maybe. You you may be wondering, uh, how, how do we exactly calculate the displaced water if the object is in the water? So what displaced water means is that, let's say this is the water before, before putting the object in. And this is the water after putting the object in. So maybe it looks something like that. So the, this, the volume of the displaced water is going to be, if you draw an imaginary line, right, from before and after, this is the volume of the displaced water from before and after, right? So um, don't worry about the, the submerged object, right? Just compare the before level and the after level. So if you want more, if you want more elaboration on where to obtain this, um, where, where do you, uh, how do you calculate this, right? Then you can, I can refer you to this video over here where I go through in a very in-depth manner to how up trust is derived, right? How Archimedes principle is derived and stuff about static pressure. Okay, so well, yeah, so that's it. Um, so, so Archimedes principle tells us that the up trust uh, tells us that the, the, the weight of the displaced water equals to the up thrust on an object. And this object right, can be either floating or sinking. Can be either floating or sunken. Right? Um, yeah. So uh, so from the volume of the displaced water, you can calculate the weight of the displaced water by multiplying by the density and the gravitational constant. Um, 
Uh, but what? Let, let's review these two scenarios. One is when it's floating, and one is when it's sink, sunken. So in both cases, right, the up thrust is still equals to the weight of the displaced water. But um, when it's floating, right, if it's floating, if the object is floating, then the up thrust is equals to the weight of the object, of the floating object. But um, yeah, because it's in static equilibrium. But if it's sunken, right, then the, then the up thrust is not equal to the weight. If it's, if it's sunken, right, if the object is sunken like that, then the up thrust plus the normal contact force between the object and the, 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 the base of the beaker, right, There'll be a up, there'll be a normal contact force over here, right? Then that is equal to the weight of sunken object. Um, yeah, so that that's, that's in a sense there's a small uh, th this concept is going to be quite important later, right? Because it's important to understand that um, in the sink in the sinking case, right, the weight, the weight of the sunken object, right? is actually higher than the up thrust. It's higher than the weight of the displaced water, which is also why only uh, an object denser than water will sink. Um, yeah, so this concept will come in important in the third part later when, because the ice, when the ice is fully melted, right, the steel ball will have sunken to the bottom. And in that case, right, we're more con we're concerned about the, we're concerned about the, the volume of the water displaced. Um, yeah, rather than the, we're, we're concerned about the weight of the water displaced rather than the weight of the steel ball. So that will come in the important, this, this concept, right, about having a sunken object, right, and relations between its up thrust and the weight of the sunken object, um, it will come in important later on for part three. So anyway, if you didn't understand that, it's okay. I'll explain it in greater detail later. As, as we go on to part three, right? So, yeah. So second part, con calculate the up thrust on acting on the steel ball when the ice is fully melted. So when the ice is fully melted, right? Um, we're just left with a steel ball and the steel ball will have sunken to the bottom, right? So when the steel ball is sunken to the bottom, the up thrust is, um, the up thrust, if we consider weight, the force body diagram on the, on the, on the steel ball, now there's actually two forces towards the top, right? And um, yeah, there's actually two forces. One is the up thrust by water, and one is the normal contact force. And then towards down, right, there's the weight. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so in this case, we can no longer say, right? We can no longer say that the weight, we can no longer say that the weight is equals to the up thrust by the water because we, we don't know how much normal contact force, we don't know how much normal contact force um, is, at the moment, we're not directly given the amount of normal contact force by the, by the bottom of the beaker on the steel ball. So, um, we can, so so yeah so so in a sense knowing the weight in a sense knowing the weight of the steel ball is not going to be useful because even if we have the weight right we don't know the, the normal contact force so we can only calculate the up thrust by the water directly right and what is the up thrust is up thrust by the displaced water is right from over here Right, is the volume of the displaced water, is the weight of the volume of the displaced water. So the up thrust is the weight of, so, so I'm referring to this part over here, but Archimedes principle, right? Archimedes principle says that the weight of the displaced water is equal to up thrust on the object. And if you want to go through a detailed derivation of it, I have a video over here talking about it. So it's the weight of the displaced water. 
And what is the weight of the displaced water? The weight of the displaced water will just be the, um, the volume of displaced water times the density of water times G. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so in this case, we're given the density of water in this question, right? 1000 kg per meter cube. We're given, we know G, and how do we find the volume of the displaced water? Well, because the steel ball is fully, fully, uh, fully submerged in the water, the volume displaced is just equals to the volume of steel. Right? And then we multiply by the other two constants. And that will give us, right, the volume of the steel ball is 4 over 3 pi 0 pi r cube. Uh, the water, density of water is 1000. And g is 9.81. And that will give us 0 0.0411 newtons. The three SI. So, yeah. Okay. So, um, so now let's go on to the hard part. The hard part is understanding right, the change in the height when the, of the water level when ice is fully melted. So it may seem hard because there's quite a lot of processes going on here. Firstly, we have um, when the ice melts, right? then uh, first of all, the steel ball will sink to the bottom. And then there'll be this additional normal contact force. right? And, um, and, and uh, the ice also adds to the water level because when ice melts to become water, it increases the water level. And in addition to that, um, the ice, there's no longer the weight of the ice, right? There's no longer the weight of the ice that displaces the water in a sense. Uh, and it may seem hard to, to, to take all this into account. It's, it could be quite a mess. Uh, but actually, what I'm going to show you is that um, actually, the ice doesn't really play a big role over here. The main, in, when it, when it boils, up, boils down to calculation, right, actually it just turns into the, it just turns into the, the, the weight of the steel ball minus the, um, minus the, the up thrust, minus the up thrust on the steel ball after the ice is melted. So let me let me just illustrate what I mean. So for part three, right? Let's consider a scenario where there isn't any there isn't any steel ball in the first place. So let's just say that there's some ice floating in the water. This ice, no steel, right? And we compare the water level before and after. So after the water has melted. So what is the what is the difference in the water level, right? Because initially the ice is floating, you can sort of see that some part of the ice is not really is is outside, right? It's outside of the water. So maybe one would think that when the ice melts, right, the water level might have increased because um because because like the additional part of the ice kind of goes into the water, but that is actually untrue because um yeah so so let's let's show let's show that the water level surprisingly stays the same so before melting right to after melting the water level stays the same so let's show that now Okay, so now we set out to, uh, to show that the water level stays the same before the ice is melted and after the ice is melted. So uh, what I want you to do is imagine that imagine that you take out the ice. Okay, so imagine you take out the ice. So initially you have the with the ice inside, you have something like that. And let's say after you take out the ice, right, the water level, okay, let's draw a bigger ice cube. Let's Right. And after you take out the ice, the water level will have fallen right, to, let's say, this level. Okay, So if you, if you take a look at the amount of water displaced 
before and after, right? So you take a, take a look at the water level before and after. Then um, this extra volume, right, this extra volume over here, what is the extra? The extra volume here, volume of water display. So this extra volume of water displaced, uh, if you take the volume of water displaced, right, and multiply by G, sorry, sorry multiply by uh, density of water and multiply by G, then that will equal to the weight of um, they'll equal to the, unless before we jump to the weight, they'll equal to upcrust on ice. Agree? And the upcrust on the ice, because the ice is floating, right? That's important. Because the ice is floating, then they'll equal to the weight of the ice cube. The weight of the entire ice cube, right? Including the parts that's above the water above the water level. And the weight of the ice cube is equals to, right? Uh, so, so, so that's the weight, it's equals to the weight of the ice cube. And then let's consider a scenario where the ice cube has melted, right? So after, after this has happened, right? Let's say the ice cube has melted. Okay, so um, let me just move this over a little bit. So let's draw another beaker. So let's say the ice cube has melted, right? And we pour the extra the, the melted ice into the water. So we pour the melted ice into the water, the original water. And if we draw a line over here representing, right, the extra melted ice, right? So so because after the ice is melted, the ice doesn't, the melted ice and the water. I'm no, sorry, the melted ice and the ice cube, right? They don't change in weight. So, I mean, after the ice cube has melted into water, right, the weight doesn't, doesn't change. So it's equal to the weight of the melted ice. And this in turn is equal to the volume, the volume of melted ice times, right? Times the density of water, times g. And what do we get, right? We get that the first thing here is equal to the last thing, right? So the first thing over here is equal to the last thing over here, which is, which and cancelling, right? Cancelling the density of water and g, we get that the conclusion is that the volume of water displaced, right? When you put the ice cube inside, right? So what I mean is that this volume of water displaced when the ice cube is inside is equals to the volume of melted ice. So imagine you take out the ice cube from the water, you melt it on the outside and you pour the melted ice back into the water. Then that's actually the same process as going from step one to step three, where you just take the initial, you just have the initial configuration, right? And the ice just melts in the water to become melted ice. So by going through this intermediate step where we imagine the process of the ice melting as taking out of the water, melting outside and pouring back in, we can deduce that um, the volume of the water displaced right over here, the volume of water displaced over here is actually equals to the volume of the melted ice. And what that means that after the ice melts, right, from the initial, even after the ice melts, right, the volume, the water level, right, the water level, doesn't doesn't change right it stays the same so um yeah so before and after the ice is melted right actually the level of water stays the same um yeah so so i think that's quite an unintuitive fact because one might expect that the extra ice over here kind of melts into the water and increases the water level but by this reasoning right um the volume of the the, the level, water level actually doesn't change. So 
what does that where does that bring us on this question? Right? That means that we can actually not we can actually not worry about the ice melting and adding extra water. Because um, even when you add a steel ball in, right, the weight of the ice, because the whole object is floating, right, the full weight of the ice, um, the, the, the full weight of the ice still is, is still lifted by the surrounding water. So that means that what can what this boils down to is when we have the beaker with the ice and the steel ball, then we can think of this as um, um, we can think of this as a scenario where where the, the where where the um, the the full the full weight of the steel ball the full weight of the steel ball um, is the, the, the steel ball is in the, so in this case the steel ball is displacing its weight of water. Okay, okay, this this phrasing is a little bit weird. Um, um, okay, okay. Let, let me let me just rephrase it in a different way. Right. This in this scenario, because because the steel ball is floating, right? It's floating. Right. Um the because the steel ball is floating, the the the, the up thrust. Um so so because the steel ball is floating, how much water is displaced by the steel ball alone? By the steel ball alone. Right, so imagine taking out the steel ball, right, and putting it. Imagine making the steel ball vanish, and imagining summoning it, conjuring it back inside the, the ice. How much water is displaced by the steel ball? And the answer is that the weight of steel equals to the weight of water displaced. Precisely because it is floating, because the steel is so called floating. Um, but so this is scenario one, right? Before ice melts. But in scenario two, right, where the ice has melted, where the ice is melted, so we do like that, and the steel ball is sunken on the bottom, right, touching the bottom surface, then the steel ball sank. It sank already. So how much water is displaced by the steel ball, right? How much water is displaced by the steel ball? The answer is, uh, in this case, the weight um, the, the, the volume, sorry, the volume of steel equals the volume of water displaced. That makes sense, right? Because it's fully submerged. So in these two scenarios, um, basically the ice is there, right? The ice is there by encasing the steel ball in ice. It allows the steel ball to sort of float in the water. Yeah, so by, by encasing the steel ball in ice, it allows the ice to, sorry, it allows the steel ball to so-called float in the water, right? Thereby displaying its weight amount of water. Whereas in the second scenario where the ice is melted, right, actually the water level 
by the previous argument, right, the water level over here doesn't, doesn't change, right? The, the, the water level doesn't change, right? But what does change is how much water is displaced. So what I'm trying to say is that the initial volume of ice, volume of, okay, actually that, that would be kind of, uh, right. Um, so, okay, so, so imagine a scenario. So, so if we didn't have the steel ball, then do you, then, then one would agree. I guess you can agree that the water level doesn't change. Right? If we didn't have the steel ball, so if it's just ice, then the water level wouldn't change. But by putting an, by putting a steel ball inside the ice, right? By putting this steel ball inside the ice, it 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 doesn't um it doesn't sink all the way to the bottom due to the average density of the ice and the steel ball being less than the water. But by putting the steel ball there, it is displacing a lot more water than it's displacing a lot more water than it would have if you just put the steel ball in the water directly. Because in this case, right, um, the only thing lifting the steel ball, the only thing lifting the steel ball is the up thrust, is the weight of the water displaced. Whereas in this case, there's also a normal contact force that is lifting the steel ball. Yeah, so I guess the, the, key, the key concept over here is that before the ice melts, because the steel ball is floating, the weight of it displaces weight, right? The weights are equal. Whereas after the ice melts, the volumes are equal. And uh, yeah, and because less, because um, so, so because less volume of water is displaced, right? Because if it displaces with weight, then a lot of water is displaced. Whereas if it's whereas if the steel ball displaces the volume, then less water is displaced. Because steel is denser than water. So to make that more formal, right, the weight of steel uh, is equal to the, the volume of steel times the density of steel, which is greater than the uh, which is greater than the volume of steel times the density of water because the density of steel is higher than the density of water, right? So in the first scenario, um, uh, so, so in the first scenario, the weight of steel is displaced. So the weight of water displaced, uh, water displaced in before the ice melts, before ice melts, is equal to this. Um, equals and this is equals to the weight of water displaced after. Right. So so we have two sin that the first scenario the weight of water displaced is much more than the weight of water displaced in the second scenario in the after scenario by this equation. So weight of water displaced before is equal to weight of steel, right? Which is equal to the volume of steel times the density of steel, which is greater than the volume of steel times the density of water. Because density of steel is higher than density of water. But then volume of the steel displaced, right? Volume of steel displaced is the volume of the water displaced. So um, yeah, so, so it which is equals to the weight of the water displaced after. That's right. So yeah, so what we get is that the first in the first scenario, the weight of the water displaced is higher than the weight of the water displaced in the second scenario. So the water level will actually drop. Yeah, so so if you compare it side by side, the water level will actually drop. And how much does it drop, right? It drops by the difference in up crust. So the difference of crust, so initially, right? Um, initially, the, the up crust is, um, so initially the up crust is the weight, so, so before, 
up trust um, is equals to the up trust uh, on steel alone is equals to the weight of steel. And after that, right, after the up trust on steel equals to the volume of water displaced times the density of water times G. Um, let me just double check. Yeah, so up trust on steel equals to the volume of water displaced on steel. Yeah, that's right. So, um, so this scenario, we have actually calculated it to be part two, right? In part two, where the ice is melted, fully melted, the up trust acting on the steel ball is 0 0.0411. And, and in the first scenario, the up trust on the steel is equal to the weight of the steel, which is equal to um, the volume for which we pi r cube times the density of steel times 9.81. Um, so if you take the difference of these two, so let's take so let's take uh, um, let's take the the before minus the after. So let's take this one. Let's take one minus two. So one minus two would give us. Um, let's punch it into the calculator, right? So one minus two. 4 over 3 times pi times 0 0.010 0 cube times 900 times 9.81 minus 0 0.0411. That will give us 0 0.28353 newtons to pi s f. And then uh, so that's the, that's, the, that's the difference in up trust, right? And the difference in up trust, this is equals to the difference in weight of water displaced. So that means that in the first, so, so to find the water level, right, we take this number. So to find the height, The water displaced. We take zero point two eight three five three divided by um divided by the the radi pi times the radius the cross sectional area, so pi times the radius of the beaker. The radius of the beaker is uh, the radius of the beaker is. Uh, 4 cm over here, 4 cm. 0 0.04 squared. Um, and then we must also divide it by 9.81. Mm. Yeah, because volume equals to rho pi r squared h. So, um, and divided by the density. So weight equals to rho pi r squared h g. So we take this. So we take that divided by pi times 0 0.04 squared times 9.81 times 1000. And we get 0 
equals the QSF. So, so the before, the before, right, is higher. The before up crust is higher than the after up crust. So the before weight of water displaced is higher than the after weight of water displaced. So the before water level, volume of water is higher than the after volume of water. And the before height of water is higher than the after height of water. Yeah. So that should conclude our discussion. Um, so to answer it, change in height is 0 0.00575. Um, yeah, where the before is higher than the after. So before height is higher than the after height. So you might want to put a negative sign over here. Yeah, so that's the answer. Um, yeah, have a nice day.